Welcome to you today. I'm Paul Peppis, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Hannah Thomas, assistant professor of dance at the University of Oregon. Professor Thomas joined the faculty in fall 2021. Thomas holds an MFA in dance and choreography, along with a teaching artist certificate from Arizona State University. She received her professional training from the DeKalb School of Arts, the Balethnic Dance Company, the Price Performing Arts Center, the McClendon School of Dance, mm -hmm. the Junior Hawks Dance Team, and the Junior Falcons Dance Team. Her teaching and guest artist experiences include adjunct and faculty positions at Grand Canyon University, Arizona State University, and, the t and as the 2021 Natalie Justina New Love Guest Artist Award recipient at the University of Oregon. Trained in many styles of dance, including contemporary dance, jazz, ballet, modern, and African, she has many other passions, among them styling and fashion, dance ministry work for local churches, screen dances, choreographing, choreographing for musical theater, and sound engineering. Professor Thomas is a member of Embodied Scholars, an exclusive group created for black hip hop teachers in higher education, and she is in the process of creating a live podcast series exploring sisterhood in the black community. Thanks, Anna, for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you with us. So happy to be here. Thank you for having me. So first, um, tell us a bit about your background. Yeah, so as my bio has stated, I am from Atlanta, Georgia. I whoo, started dancing when I was three years old. My mom was a dancer, so I really started because she was a dancer and she was a mover. Um, she worked super heavy in our local church, and so I really got you know my start there in choreographing and moving um, in that sort of like worship aspect and. From there, I went to DeKalb Elementary School of the Arts. Um, I've really been in performing arts like K through 12. So that's, that's all I knew. Um, and so I was in a, bit, a few companies, um, Price Performing Arts, McClendon. Um, and yeah, I just, I've been dancing since I was little. Um, I didn't really get passionate about it until the sixth grade when I made my first company. So I was like, okay, I can do this. This is, some, uh, you know, I, I'm good at this. Um, so yeah, that uh, really encompasses um, my start. Um, my mom really has been a pillar in my so, artistic so, career. So what made you want to become a teacher of dance? You know, it was something that I was good at. Um, I've been doing it since I was 12, teaching um, and choreographing, but when I was in my MFA program, I, a part of my assistantship, I taught a Hip Hop One class all my semesters that I was there, so that's six straight semesters, and so I was able to build like a different curriculum every time or just, you know, flesh out what I wanted to teach and leave my mark, my, my legacy there. Um, I also got a teaching certificate at ASU, a part of my MFA, and all of my peer reviews and uh, the you know, accolades, they were like, you're really good at this. And so I decided to go with what was easy for me in my flow state, really, okay, so I'm, I'm a great dancer, great choreographer, but I have like something with teaching. And so I decided to pursue that further. I did adjunct at GCU and ASU as well. And then Oregon contacted me. So why? Um teaching in higher education, why not some other, you know, level of teaching? Yeah, uh, there's something about dancers or students who already um, have a desire or a passion for dance. It's mm -hmm. easier to help them mold and shape their desire. I got offered a position at a high school in Arizona, actually, um, much like what I'm doing now, but just for high school. And I was like, you know, I'm good at that and that would be really cool, but it's not what I'm passionate about. I knew that it would be more of a, a task, more of an ask for me. Um, so I'm able to work with already passionate dancers and that's just much easier for me. So yeah. one of your areas of expertise as a dance as a dancer and as a dance instructor is hip hop dance. Yeah. So yeah. what's distinct about hip hop dance? What are some of the things that, you know, if we saw hip hop dance, how mm -hmm. would we know? Community. I'm telling you, it has been such a joy to work with the students here and to teach them about the culture of hip, uh, of hip hop, which is community. And a lot of kids nowadays, students nowadays, they really associate hip hop to choreography, get in a combination of five, six, seven, eight. But the 
um, the foundation of hip hop is all about that cultural practice of being together, seeing each other, grooving together, finding rhythm, listening and engaging with the music. They're one and they're one and the same. And so, um, if anybody was looking at hip hop or seeing people, whether in the streets, you know, at a party, on a stage, if they're seeing each other and they're grooving, they're with the music. Um, than that community aspect that's hip hop. Mm -hmm. So um, you're, you're the curator of um, Duck Jam. Yeah. And that's a special dance showcase uh, that's happening on June 1st at 7 p.m. in the Gerlinger Annex on the University of Oregon campus. Yeah. Tell us about Duck Jam and what participants and spectators who attend can expect. Man, the Duck Jam. My first you will baby. Um, I was inspired by one of my late mentor and professors from um, Arizona State University. His name is Marcus White. And he had this thing um, called the Expo where all the hip hop classes would get together um, to present their finals. And um, in his legacy and how much he really poured a lot of hip hop knowledge into me, I wanted to bring that to the UO. I wanted to allow, have my students not just perform their final dance presentations, for that class, but to celebrate hip hop culture and dance, to have a more authentic experience of what hip hop culture is. There's gonna be a live DJ, I'll be emceeing. Um, we have several um, student groups around UO campus coming in and maybe even from the Eugene community at large, um, coming in to just dance together, party together. Um, so yeah, it's participants, the audience, one and the same because there'll be some social dance aspects where everybody will be dancing together. There'll be a huge cypher session where Flock Rock crew, um, the breaking crew will come in and showcase some of their very athletic moves and then we'll invite the common folk, you know, to come in and to, you know, just show their best moves. And so, and then, you know, we'll, we'll have, you know, a whole showcase and then the audience will be able to not just spectate, but to support what's happening on the stage. So they will be a part of it and then they will be able to just like take it in and cheer and support. So the circle of the cipher will just sort of open up, but it'll be one and the same. So um, another uh, exciting thing about the UO Dance mm -hmm. Department um, is that it's added a BFA yeah. to its curriculum. Um, why is that, and what's important about that program? There's some really important and distinct things it about is. it. It is, yeah. Our program is founded upon the desire to equally study all idioms and not to give hierarchy to maybe the Western, you know, forms of dance, but students have to go through all idioms to go through our program and a lot, a lot of other programs, you know, you get to really pick and choose, but we want to make sure that the dancers are well-rounded in different type of rhythms and movement patterns of the body so that they can be ready for whatever the dance industry of the time is, you know, throwing at them or looking for, um, they'll be just way more versatile. And it's also, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. the only uh, dance BFA in the state of Oregon. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, it is. <laughs> Very cool. So um, you've already made clear when you dis were you describing Duck Jam that um, for you, music is a crucial part of dance. Yeah. So t tell us a little bit about how you collaborate with musicians. Mm -hmm. I, who here um, at at UO, I've had several, I mean, I, I don't teach just hip hop. So I've taught a contemporary class and I've had Marcus Johnson, who is an amazing um, collaborator, uh, just sort of like view and watch what's happening and then riff off of, you know, what's happening on the dancers' bodies. Um, in terms of hip hop, I think, it's so important to give students of this generation the nuggets from the past. Mm -hmm. So a lot of those um, weighted rhythms that, you know, really get your body moving um, and calling that back, you know, bringing that to them and allowing them um, to just take a little uh, field trip back into the past. But it's also important for them to know that just like, you know, the trap hip hop music that's happening now, you know, they are also paying homage to 
the rappers and the musicians that came before them. And so to find the, you know, the origin story of a lot of the rhythms and um, that we use, especially, especially for hip hop, um, is important. And I will be actually going to New York June 5th through the 12th as a choreographer fellow to collaborate with live musicians and a composer in real time and dancers to create a new work in progress. And so, I don't know, it's just important with, with music, when I'm making any new work, I like to uh, listen first and then get inspired by the music. So that's how I do my classes and my work. So who are some of the hip hop artists that have inspired you? Uh, that's one question. And then yeah. others, who are some of the dancers that have Yeah, you? well, hip hop artists, um, he goes by many names now, Puff Daddy, Diddy, Mace. Um, I love Missy Elliott because she makes amazing music to dance to. Um, who else? There's so many. Uh, Q-Tip, um, obviously, you know, Kendrick Lamar. Um, there's a lot of music, right? But I, I have an affinity for old school hip hop. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and the, all, some of the names are, are you know, escaping me but old school hip-hop has a special place in my heart because it is just the best music to dance to mm -hmm. you know and to not even dance to but to groove to you know and like really find um, an authentic groove in, in in the body so as far as dancers Camille Brown uh, Malik Washington all of the dancers that are a part of the embodied scholar groups that I'm a uh, that I'm a part of uh, we have an IG group where we just filter in information opportunities um, and you know we just sort of like uh, build each other up in academia um, because there's so few of us here and so I honor them um, I love their their work and then my mom <laughs> So you just mentioned the Embodied Scholars Group. Tell yeah. us about that group. You know, it. I was invited. Um, it's a very informal. It's a very informal group full of movers, thinkers, scholars who are making waves in academia um, that are also identified as you know black people. And so, um, yeah, we just share all of our triumphs, some of our woes. Um, we encourage each other. Uh, there are some opportunities to go to conferences and present work together. And so it's really doing a great job of keeping the retention rate mm -hmm. of black scholars mm -hmm. in academia. Yeah, that's a huge challenge. It's, it's huge. a huge challenge. And yeah. the, the higher, uh, higher education in the United States has not done a good job with that. And you know, and I feel like groups like this where you can see each other and you can see yourself in the person that you're looking, um, looking at or talking to, it helps. And there's also groups like that on campus and that I'm a part of as and, well. And em Emerging Scholars is a na nationwide group? No, it's actually just, um, it's, it's on, scholars, yeah, yeah, scholars. and Body Scholars is, is actually on Instagram, you know, mm -hmm. we've kind of found each other and we, we have to stay with the times, so um, yeah, it, but yes, nationwide, there's people from all over, universities from all over, but it's hosted on Instagram. So you, um, among the many, many things that you mm -hmm. do is you do musical theater. You yeah, do I do. Choreography in the context of musical theater. So tell us a little bit about some of the yeah. work you've done there. In my undergrad, I was the first undergrad at Georgia College to choreograph a um, a lot of the great moments in the play A Streetcar Named Desire, and that was really the first time that made me be like, oh, okay, this I can do something here too. I can also put my dance here. Um, and then at Arizona State University, I partnered with Kristen Hunt and Melissa Britt on uh, Ajax. Um, and so we made some really cool uh, moments happen there. And then also at Arizona State, I choreographed the musical, I was the lead choreographer for the musical um, Runaways. Um, and it was such a, a challenge, but such a joy because we were still in the thick of COVID. And so we had to make the whole thing virtual and we had to go through a lot of protocols. Um, but it turned out to be a very beautiful virtual experience. We had to get creative. It really challenged me as an artist on how to think about engaging the audience through a screen. Mm -hmm. And we also, we, I mean, we had a, um, a built set, but then a lot of the the actors and the dancers, one and the same, they, you know, we gave them tasks to go and choreograph in different places and we had an amazing editor. Um, and the musical director, Toby Yatso, 
Um, well, the director Tobiasso and then Mario um, was the musical director. We, as a team, just really made some magic happen for those students. <laughs> <laughs> That's so wonderful. So you are you are also involved with dance ministry. Mm -hmm. So. What is dance ministry, and then have you been able to do it in the Eugene Springfield area? So, okay, dance ministry is coupled with um, the Christian faith, and so I grew up um, in Light of the World Christian Tabernacle International in Stockbridge, Georgia. Um, the bishop is actually, the archbishop is actually my godmother, so, you know, I was very integrated. Um, and dance ministry is just the body as an instrument of worship where, you know, you have the singers, their voice is their instrument, um, or you have the preachers, their, their voice and how they, you know, bring uh, the word is their instrument. And so I am very passionate about taking what I've learned from my MFA program and the excellence from there, um, my skill and also what I know about anointing and, you know, making a really powerful message through dance and coupling those together so that the kingdom has really awesome work. And there are several people who are doing that right now. So I can't even say that I'm, you know, one of one, um, but I'm very passionate about it. I partner with Faith, Faith Christian Center in Arizona to create a screen dance called This Must Be The Place. It won um, a selection into a dance festival. Um, and so I am very just passionate about doing that. And I am also th in partnership in works of um, partnering with Cove Church here in Eugene to get some more of that out, um, some more of that type of work out. And so, yeah, very fortunate, very blessed. So you just mentioned screen dance, mm -hmm. another thing that you do is screen <laughs> dance. So tell us about what screen dance is and what you've done with it. Yeah, uh, I've done two prominent works so far with screen dance, and both of them have been commissioned through Faith Christian Center. So how the way that I've been able to um, get funded and also you know have the freedom to really express myself is through um, that ministry work. And so... I've created a piece for um, Christmas, and it was called We Th uh, Three Wise Men um, from the East. And then I just did a piece to Chandler Moore's rendition, um, acoustic rendition of his song Yahweh to This Must Be the Place. And it was uh, located at this beautiful church that had glass stained windows. Um, and that was just such a special experience for me because. I had heard the song multiple times, but it was then I was inspired to put dance to it. And so I listened, I got the whole thing in my head, and then I got my Google Doc out and I put the literally whatever I saw, I wrote it, and then I was able to see that from editing. And it was, that's, also, that's always a, a blessing to me, just a beautiful um, gift is that when I, what I see in my head, I get to see in, in real life. And that's why I like screen dance. Mm -hmm. So I get to take the ideas, the visions, and put it in reality, which is a lot of the work that I do on stage as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, you have this film project that you're working on, uh, on Black Joy. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so it is constantly moving. You know, uh, I, I think it's gonna be a film one day. It might be a stage, you know, a stage rendition um, another day, but I'm very passionate about putting more black joy in front of people that either look like me, don't look like me, um, because a lot of what we see in this day and age is black trauma. And I am, there's so much more to um, the African American culture than just trauma. There's so much joy, there's so much survival and, thri and thriving. And so I love music and a part of that, um, I wanna create an experience, whether on camera, whether on stage, whether in immersive, um, an immersive experience of just highlighting some of the awesome music that has carried our culture from, you know, the time that we were brought over here to like now, old hymns to these, you know, hip hop anthems to, you know, now, you know, spoken word, just this black saturation of art and excellence. And so that's kind of where I'm going, how it's gonna come about, you know, that changes almost every day. So um, you're also working on a podcast series about black sisterhood. Tell yeah, so one. I, um, my MFA thesis for Arizona State University, um, it was called Her Brown Body is Glory. And it 
it really emphasized healing through sisterhood, um, moving beyond trauma, being seeing yourself in the person that you're able to discuss and divulge and, and, and you know release a lot of your trauma with. Um, I worked with 10 undergraduate students. Um, the show was about an hour long and we really got a lot of beautiful work done. And so I've just al always been interested, I think in my, in my time right now, being in Eugene, I'm craving sisterhood. I'm craving, you know, a community. I just moved here in September. So I'm still, you know, really, um, trying to find my 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 feet in being planted and so um, I, I just had you know idea an idea of the people that I do meet the black women that I do meet um, creating a space to where we can you know get together talk about some of our experiences whether they be navigated through topics or just like free flow um, but having a safe space to just have joy and maybe cry and you know present things eat food break bread one of the greatest ways to have communities to break bread with each other and so that you know that is it, it's an idea um, that I've had and that I've played with that is a um, continuation of my MFA thesis her brown body is glory so um, it's obviously clear from a lot of what you've said um, that you have a very passionate and unique approach to teaching mm -hmm. dance. Mm -hmm. So talk about your philosophy of teaching. Yeah, I with my students, I like to build trust first with themselves, with me, and then with each other. Um, because it's hard to dance in front of people. It's hard to learn new things that you may have not you know, learned before. Uh, or even if you have a, a good knowledge of it to build upon that skill, it's hard to be vulnerable and maybe you know, making mistakes um, in front of other people. And so I, a huge part of my, te my teaching philosophy is just building trust first, trust in community, and then allowing the students to see themselves in each other so that they can just be free. And I'm telling you, since 2017, my first um, class at Arizona State, it has not failed me yet. It's been fail-proof. Just in really getting the students to, to trust themselves, like, okay, what I have in my body is valid. It is to be celebrated, and the information that I'm learning is to just enhance, not um, to validate me or to, you know, obviously as, you know, educators, it's my job to assess and to correct as needed, but it's not a, you know, uh, um, it's not to demean anything that they, they possess, what they have is enough and who they are are enough. And so that's a, a huge thing. I love to, to do group activities because it gets them, you know, a lot of people <laughs> have made lifelong friends from my from my classes. Some even, you know, get together and date, you know, so it's they're able to to talk and to release a lot of stress and to have a party when they come in, even if we're doing choreography or drills like they leave sweating but they leave happy so t tell us a little bit more how do you build trust how do you I mean yeah. you can talk about it and you mm -hmm. say you know but how do you how do you build that yeah so a, a lot of what I do um, especially for hip-hop um, we do ciphers and I teach them things to get them comfortable with what they have and then we open up um, with freestyle circles to so where they go in and they maybe try some of that I give them uh, the people that are on the outside um, their etiquette or their rules on the outside of the cypher circle you are keeping the rhythm which means you're constantly moving this is how you're engaged you are the hype crowd so if you see something you let them know and then you're also um, yeah, the, the eyes and the ears. And so you want to make sure that the person on the inside who is using a lot of courage to go in can feel supported by you. And a lot of a lot of times students tell me um, that activity, the group activities, reflections, um, and then just me dancing with them constantly really help really has helped them to show up every time and show up, not just in attendance, but show up and be present in the class. So. so tell us about a class that you're teaching now or that you've recently taught. Yeah, so in my Hip Hop 3 class, I, honestly my spring term classes, they have a huge part of my heart. I am enjoying them. Um, I am teaching a Hip Hop 3 class that are going, that, and we're exploring freestyle um, and really just 
improving our freestyle, how we enter into either a cypher circle or how we enter into um, a battle or a competition or just while we're listening to music. How can we riff and engage and not just listen but engage with the music? I'm teaching a lecture course called Looking at Dance and we are looking at dance through the lens of the African American experience um, from the ring shout to hip hop. And so like there's a lot in between um, and really just breaking down a lot of the origins of some of the dances that we love so much in America have roots in African-American culture. And so, yeah, then my Hip Hop 2 class, we're looking at choreography. Um, in my Hip Hop 1 class, we are looking at social party dances. And so there is a long array of just like content and they are killing it. And I love, I love it. Yeah, the spring term has been amazing. Yeah. So you mentioned the the, um, the battle and the competition mm -hmm. part mm -hmm. of hip hop dance. Say a little bit more about that. How does that fit in and why is that important? To yeah, I mean, the way it started, it started in community, but as we've seen hip hop sort of evolve from, you know, the time in the Bronx with the Latinx and the black youth, it's been a way for, you know, b-boys, b-girls, poppers, lockers, crumpers, you know, house lofting dancers, freestylers, you, you know, just have anything. It's been a way, you know, for you to just sort of like check in with your training and to have community. So even though there's a battle and a competition happening, even with crews, um, with choreography, there are uh, competitions and battles for that as well. But even though that battle aspect is happening, it's still all love or it should all be still love, and that's a huge part of the hip-hop culture. Um, and so with the Duck Jam, eventually I want to bring in that element, but right now in the maybe the first two years, um, I'm really just inviting the students to um, showcase and not be compared or any of that just yet. Um, but while inviting breakers and people from the community who have tons of experience in that to give, you know, to lead by example so that, and, and we're actually doing some of that in my classes right now with my freestyle. We had like a freestyle battle and then in my hip hop too, we had like a crew routine battle. So I'm giving them whispers of it, you know, a little taste, a sample, but eventually, you know, there, there'll be a jam for that, but they have them, you know, all over, especially in Portland. So you mentioned that you're, you, one of the classes you're teaching is a lecture class. Mm -hmm. So um, do you show them? Do you dance during a lecture class? We do. So say a little bit about that, because when we think about lecture class, mm -hmm. it's not what we think mm -hmm. of. Yeah, so the lecture class, it, it happens in Girlinger Annex 352 um, most times, and we have projector, and uh, it is a an, uh, an hour and 50 minute class and so usually what happens I'll, I'll have my content or the assigned reading and we watch videos so we're gonna look at dance mm -hmm, in this mm -hmm. in this class and then we're also going to engage with dance so whatever the topic is um, we've had you know uh, some tap some Lindy Hop we yeah, I just we just went through the Big Apple together um, and so the next course of content that we're going to do is hip hop and so my students will at in my lecture class will also have an opportunity to engage with the duck champ for extra credit um, to just see a little bit more of the culture of hip hop and so yeah we dance and it you know it kind of jars them at first but I think they expect that because it happens in a dance studio mm -hmm. um, and, it, and it also just helps them to like navigate in the body oh this is what they're doing and this is hard or this is what they're doing and oh I can do this and maybe I'm a little interested in learning a little bit more about dance can I see some of your other classes and so yeah it's foolproof. <laughs> so you've you've made very clear how much you enjoy your the work that you do mm -hmm. so what attracted you to the University of Oregon? You know it was because the University of Oregon was attracted to me oh, I'm sorry <laughs> it was because they were attracted to me um, I, they, they contacted me um, specifically to build this uh, program in the hip hop res uh, representation here in the department. And I trusted the people who put my name forth for this opportunity that, you know, they saw something in me to go here and to put, you know, my, my heart in this program. And I think that the University of Oregon just has an amazing um, foundation to like do some awesome stuff. Dean Sabrina um, Cannon has just been uh, my champion, honestly. Uh, 
she really sold me, <laughs> you know, on coming here and, you know, uh, and during the rainy season. Um, but yeah, it's been, it's been awesome. I feel very supported by my colleagues here, um, not just as an art, not, not just as an educator, but also as an artist. I've done some guest residencies already um, in my first year and traveling to present, you know, solos and things. And so to have the support of the department, um, and there's there's also just a, a a hunger that is developing here in the dance department, and I'm I'm really excited to be just on the ground floor. You know, I was like, I would be remiss to not um, take this opportunity to be on the ground floor of something beautiful blossoming. And so, yeah, that's why University of Oregon. So Hannah, we're almost at the end of our time. This is yeah. going to be my last question. Um, you already just were saying you uh, you obviously you're a performer. Yeah. So when are you performing next? You know, when am I performing next? The Spring Loft which is June 3rd, I believe at 7 p.m. in the Girl in Your Annex. Um, I am performing a solo that I just did in Milwaukee at the Restore Festival. And it is, um, this piece is paying homage to the voices in the praise houses that um, happened in Antebellum South, where enslaved African Americans created these spaces to praise and worship and prayer, um, you know, and with, within their own community. Um, without, you know, being, you know, without having an overseer or anybody, you know, around, but to believe in, um, not of a God of oppression, but of deliverance. And that's how a lot of in the African-American community, we have these old hymns that are, are really just so full of survival and are so full of wisdom. And so a lot of the songs are, f the songs that, um, that this work will be talking about our old hymns. I have um, this beautiful elderly voice, um, an, an elder, she's singing. And then I have Carlton Pearson, who just sort of like gives this um, comedic, but also powerful explanation of why old timey music is important. And so, yeah, ring shouts, you know, it, it's just, it's exploring a lot. And so that'll be the next time I'll be performing in the Spring Loft. 7 p.m., I believe, June 3rd, in the Girlinger Annex. Well, Hannah Thomas, thank you so much for talking with us today. It was really great to meet you and to talk to you, and thanks for all the exciting things that you're bringing to our community thank and sharing you. with our students. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks so much for watching, uh, for joining us. My guest today has been Hannah Thomas, Assistant Professor of Dance at the University of Oregon. See you next time.